guys, I'm going to be showing you one way of organizing investigations. Okay, it happens to be a very popular one, partly because uh, the manual that captures the method was published by UNESCO, and it's available in 14 different languages at, at, to date. Okay, now, almost everything I'm gonna tell you today is something that uh, most investigators, if they're at all successful, do in one form or another. They may call it something else, although almost everybody now is using the term hypothesis. That's a recent development. It happened within the last 12 years, partly because of this book. But all of them are focused not so much on ferreting out wrongdoing as on organizing the material they're gathering. This is above all a method for keeping your work together, understanding where you're going and how you're going to get there. If you don't do that, which pretty much describes me for the first 15 years of my career, well, make that first 12 years or so. If you don't do that, you can still manage to do an investigation, but it's gonna be longer, slower, less confident and a hell of a lot more painful. And it will also be very difficult for you to collaborate with everybody else. You know, my career began at the end of the 1970s, can you imagine? And at the time we were mostly lone rangers. That period is over, okay? Right now, the major investigations are done in collaboration with a few exceptions like uh, Andrew Jennings who brought down FIFA and Emery Castoret, who was the woman who broke the contaminated blood story in France. Nowadays, uh, we work together and to work together, you have to have some kind of common system or common method. So the elements I'm gonna show you today are methods that are used by, you know, the, the great, great majority of the people I know in the Global Investigative Journalism Network. Let's get into it now. By the way, Luke Sengers is my co-author, research partner, and co-teacher in story-based inquiry. Can we take a look at the second slide, Ian? Okay. Guys, these are the things that editors tell you when you say you want to investigate something. They don't, they don't get what you're talking about, probably because you're hitting them with a confused mass of facts. One day in 1940, a woman got off a train in the provincial town of Vichy, and walked across town and a little dog got in her way and by now we're already asleep. Okay, so we have to be much more clear about what we are doing in order to get it past the first gatekeepers. The second thing is that people say that investigation takes too much time. Well, it does take a lot of time, but a lot of the time it takes is wasted. It's wasted in searching for things we already have, it's wasted in trying to figure out where we're going. It's wasted in not knowing where to look for something, et cetera. And finally, it's wasted in trying to pull a story together out of all this data we've collected. By the way, data doesn't only refer to bits on a computer. It refers to any information that you have gathered or discovered or looked at closely. So, you know, we can be more efficient at what we're doing. And the same thing applies to the money. People think investigation is expensive. My God, I did a project uh, with Greenpeace a couple of years ago about the common agricultural policy. And uh, everybody wanted to know how much it cost. We had an eight person team. It cost us about 20,000 euros. Other NGOs thought, you know, who were asking what will it cost to get a team like this, thought the budget would be 10 times as much. No, you know, you don't have to waste money in order to get an investigation done. Some things are more costly than others, okay? But, you know, honestly, they don't have to be as costly as you think. Let's keep going. Okay, now here is the core of the procedure that's followed by most serious investigative journalists today. The first is we start with a hypothetical story, something we think is true. 
If it's not true, we're going to find out because we're going to verify that story and we're going to try and disprove it as well as prove it. But if you don't have a story, you don't know what you're looking for. And if you don't know what you're looking for, your chances of finding it go down. In fact, they go down very deep and very fast. The hypothesis tells you what you are looking at, what you are looking for, and what you think the story is. I'm gonna show you how to make one in a moment. The second thing is we look for a timeline, sequence of events. We'll get into that in some detail as well, which means I'm gonna be moving pretty fast, so don't be shocked, okay? Um, the third thing is we map the sources. We figure out who is in the story. Maybe they're people who appeared in the timeline. Maybe there are other people who were watching the events but didn't take place in actions. Maybe they are people who were victims, whatever. We put these people into a spatial representation. The fourth thing is structuring as you research. And if you'll note, a timeline and a source map are already structures. They're not just structures to hold your data, although they do a very good job of that. They are narrative structures. In the Western tradition, they've been around at least since Homer, who used a timeline to construct the Iliad and a map to construct the Odyssey. These things correspond to stuff that's hardwired in the human brain. The alternative to putting your material in a structure as you research is letting it pile up and up and up until you end up like the kid on Christmas Day who sees a pile of manure in the living room and says, there must be a pony inside. It's so much better just to get on the animal and ride. You know, so keep that in mind. As you collect information, you are going to be putting it in a structure. And I'll show you what we do with that structure later. Let's continue. Okay, this is the Oxford English Dictionary definition of a hypothesis. Okay, you will note something about this. This is proposed or provisional. The evidence at your disposal is limited. And you use it to move now, what this implies is that your hypothesis, uh, my connection is unstable. Can you still hear me? Can people still hear me? Ian, can you hear me? Hello? If you, uh, whatever hypothesis you begin with is going to change. In the story-based inquiry manual, okay, I speak about the moment when this occurred in my own career. My boss had uh, asked me to prove that American doctors were murdering prematurely born babies to stop them from growing up with handicaps. That's a notion I didn't find plausible at all, but I did try to verify it because, you know, my job was at stake. And by looking at every component of that statement, I came up with evidence that pointed in a very different direction. What was actually happening was that the uh, doctors in question were keeping kids alive who otherwise would have died. And the result was a massive population of the handicapped for whom the American government, by the way, had just cut off social security. So, you know, the fact that the initial hypothesis was completely mistaken did not make it useless because it contained elements that could be verified. We started from some evidence, a remark someone made to my boss, and then we verified all the facts that were in the hypothesis. Doctors, which doctors are killing babies? Well, that's pretty hard. How do you kill a kid in a hospital and get away with it? So we put that aside. Prematurely born babies, 
Well, what do we know about prematurely born babies? It turns out a lot. We can tell how many there are, for example. We can tell how severe their degree of handicap is. And we can create a timeline based on when that issue began to appear. We did all of these things and arrived at something completely different. It was a big turning point for me. And it was also, by the way, the start of this method. Let's keep going, okay? We've already discussed this, let's keep going. So here's how you write a hypothesis. Ask a question and then answer it. A hypothesis is not a question. It's the answer to a question. How did hundreds of hemophiliacs in France become contaminated with AIDS? The National Center for Blood Transfusion gave them products that contained the virus. Did they know they were doing that? No, we don't think so. No one would do that. When you verify, it turns out they did. You ask a question, answer it, and then verify the answer. This is the fundamental procedure. Let's step forward again. Now, there are three main sources of ideas for investigation. And by the way, when you're starting out, this is the one that always drives you nuts. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna investigate? Well, there are generally three sources. One of them is word of mouth. Somebody tells you something is going on and then you check it out. The big problem with word of mouth is that you have to develop your judgment about how trustworthy someone is when you speak to them. And it's not always what you think. Sometimes people who have been through something terrible become kind of crazy, okay? They, they have a very hard time expressing themselves in a clear manner, but they did see something and they do know what's going on. And if they say they have proof, what you say is, why well, I'd like to see your proof. There's a guy who won a Pulitzer that way by verifying the ravings of uh, a guy on a street corner in New York who said bankers are thieves and I can prove it. He could prove it, but nobody was looking at the box of documents he had at his feet. The second thing is leftovers, okay? Leftovers is when you are looking at the news media and someone publishes a story that leaves out the essential. Something strange has happened, okay? A pharmacy in uh, Dakar is robbed by men holding AK-47s. The police show up three minutes later. How did they get there three minutes late? Well, my theory would be that somebody said to them, don't go near that pharmacy until 12 noon, okay? Maybe. Maybe there is something else happening that is in the news and you think this is not enough. That's actually how uh, the Guardian got onto the Murdoch case. Nick Davies uh, read a news account by, that included a press statement from somebody at the News of the World saying, oh gosh, you know, the fact that we hacked a star is a one-off, we had nothing to do with it. And Nick thought, wait a minute, you know, they're running stuff like this every week, it's a system. And he set out to document the system and he succeeded and ultimately put the news of the world out of business. The third thing is something you see and it doesn't make sense. Something that is in front of you. Uh, an example of this would be, uh, guy named Chris DeStope. Chris is the guy who put the traffic in women, traffic in human beings in Europe on the map. And that story began when Chris was walking down the street in Brussels on his way to work. And he suddenly noticed that all the prostitutes were black. The week before they had been white. You know, so he asked the police, what's this about? And the police say, well, you know, they all came here to make money that they're going to send home to Africa. Well, 
maybe that's true for one or two women, I don't know. But how come all of a sudden every prostitute in the district was black? That single fact speaks to organization. Prostitution is not a crime in Belgium, but pimping is. So we're talking about organized crime here. It took Chris four years to get that story. Okay, and uh, he did a fantastic job with it and laid down the prototype for all the investigations that have followed. But I emphasize that story happened because Chris had his eyes open and he saw a significant change in his environment and asked what could behind it, what could be behind it, and answered organized crime. Let's continue. Okay. Now, I have this uh, slide in here. And Ian, if we can handle the interaction, I'd like to. Can we handle it? Please advise me. Yeah, let's, let's, let's give it a go. Okay. So this is one of my favorite little investigations. You know, we're not always looking at wrongdoing, folks. Sometimes we're just looking at stuff that falls off the tracks. There's so much stuff that falls off the tracks. And you know, the tracks could have been maintained better. So this was one of my students, this isn't her picture. One of my students came in to class and said, I wore uh, decorative lenses to a party on Saturday night, went home drunk, didn't take out the lenses, woke up with an eye infection. I went to see my doctor and he said, if you'd seen me two hours later, which by the way was a great piece of luck for her because it was Sunday morning in Paris. And uh, he said that if she had been two hours later, she would have been blind. Her hypothesis is that this was happening to other girls. Now, that's her hypothesis. What do you think is causing this? Why would these girls go blind? Is it a defective product? Anybody, if you think it's a defective product, shout. Yeah, so maybe if you wanna just type in the chat function what you think is going on here. Uh, just, yeah, just type it in and I'll, um, we'll, we'll see what people think. Let me give people a moment uh, just to... Okay, so Jackie Ramsey thinks it's a de defective product. Okay, so what if this happened to 70 girls? Potentially is right, Jackie. What if this happened to 70 girls a year? Do you think they were all using the same product? Undisclosed chemicals within the product. Okay. Does anyone in this group wear contact lenses? Something in the water or air where they live. Someone did it to her. No, no. Okay. So Vera Okeya wears contact lenses. What happens if you never take your lenses out and clear them, clean them? What happens if you never take your lenses out and clean them? You get an infection. Yeah. So maybe that's what happened to her. So our hypothesis was, ah, instructions on how to use were inadequate. Okay, let's keep, uh, let's keep going here. Our hypothesis, the hypothesis we took was that people were using these products incorrectly. Okay, so Nasser had infections in the past, so we know this can happen. Our initial evidence is anecdotal, but we use it to construct a hypothesis. Our experience can help us to construct a hypothesis. The hypothesis we constructed was that, you know, basically there's user error in how people are using these. So the question is, how does the error occur? Okay. Yes, yes, Maria. It could be a defective product, but if this is happening to a lot of people, which we're gonna check, now I wanna show you how not to do this. Next slide, please, Ian. This is how not to do this. And by the way, that's me. <laughs> I used to do that. I used to be the monkey with the telephone. 
I'd pick up the phone and say, is your product dangerous? Why would anyone tell me that? Okay, the monkey with the telephone is basically someone who's begging for a banana. And I say that was me because for many years, I was also doing news work. And in news work, the goal is to get a quote before the end of deadline period. You have to get something to put in the paper. So you have to ask questions knowing that the answers are going to be ridiculous. I remember once calling a, a French ministry and saying, are you investigating this financier? And she said, I can't tell you that. I said, I knew you couldn't tell me that. She said, why did you call me? And I said, because I'm required to. I said, I have to call you and give you the opportunity to comment or not. And I think it's as ridiculous as you do in this particular case. There I was being the monkey with the telephone. So if we're going to stop being the monkey with the telephone, we have to think about what we can get for ourselves without ever speaking to anyone else. What we can get from open sources. Let's look at the next slide. Okay. In other words, what are the easiest things we can check? Anything that is in the public domain, anything we can see by walking up to it, anything we can gather from published sources, scientific literature, for example, is easy to check. And you get faster at it as you go along, by the way. You know, let's hit the next one. So here are some easy things we can check here. We can check the girls actually wear these lenses. We could uh, look at the uh, we could look at the products that are on sale in a pharmacy. We can look at the companies that are making them, and we could look at databases from national health administrations that track incident reports involving pharmaceutical products. When we did that, we found there were 70 girls a year in France going blind from this. France wasn't the only place, as we'll see later. Okay, let's continue. Now, we have to ask, why are we doing this? This is gonna be more work. Okay, in this case, you know, to me, the idea that my students could write a story that would keep 70 girls from going blind every year made the story important. When people are hurt, killed, uselessly, for no possible social gain, that makes a story important, even if it's just one person. What else makes a story important? Anybody have any ideas? No? Just well, you have to, pardon me? Let's just give people a, just give people a moment. Any, any other ideas you want yes, to Yes, Maria, about? saving lives is important, and that's what we just said. Does anyone, uh, does anyone else have an idea? Injustice makes a story important. I agree completely. What else? The manufacturer did not use instructions. Moral perspective is what people are saying here. More, moral perspectives make, make a story important. Well, I don't agree. A moral perspective matters, but we don't put our moral perspective into the investigation until we know clearly what happened. Okay, for me, the moral perspective is stop unnecessary suffering. Okay, I think that's an ob obvious mission, make people's lives better. That's an obvious mission, but that does not suffice to make a story important. What makes a story important? We've got a couple more here, um, Mark, uh, uncovering corruption, abuse of power. Yeah, guys, I have to tell you, I'm looking at your comments and all of you are making an assumption that the manufacturer in this story is at fault. You can make that assumption. It can be your investigative hypothesis, but I want to warn you against the bias of thinking that everyone is evil. It's not true. A lot of what's wrong in the world is just a mistake. I've met, I've interviewed, I think, well over 10,000 people in the course of my career 
I can think of a half dozen who were truly evil. That's not a high percentage. Our job is not to destroy people, okay? I think it's to save people. Okay, so Anitha thinks that the answer is that it touches a lot of people, okay? People want to know how the story may affect them. Yes, there's a lot of people who use these lenses. That makes it important too. There's another aspect of this that you guys aren't thinking of. The dramatic interest of the story. We are telling stories. We're not just giving people facts. The dramatic aspect of the story will have a large effect on its impact. The way in which we make the story real now, from that standpoint, saying a lot of people wear lenses shows us a key to the dramatic impact. This could happen to you. It could happen to your daughter. It could happen to your friend. Maria says, why do girls or boys need to change their eye color? Well, maybe they want to look pretty or they want to look different. That's part of being young. Doesn't bother me a bit. I don't think a girl should be, I'm not saying that you're suggesting this, Maria, but it's not a crime to want to have different eyes. Stop wrongdoing, intentional or not, from being repeated. Yes, that is important too. But I repeat, think of the dramatic angle as well. And when you look at the dramatic angle, you get another take on how many people have to be involved. Because sometimes a single individual story is so dramatic and illuminates so many issues that it's worth doing. The difficulty is a second question. You need to assess how difficult the story will be before you go into it, which means you need to say, what are we going to find out? What are we going to need to learn in order to make this story work? I see you, Maria. Thank you. The uh, issue here, you know, in tracking down this, this story of infections, the story is not very difficult. Nearly all of the information that we need is in the public domain. A story becomes difficult at the point where it involves getting secrets from people, getting people to tell information that uh, compromises them unless we can figure out a path around it. If you are working on a closely held secret, you can get at it, but the time of the story may then be measured in years. That's how long it took to get the contaminated blood story. And I worked on another story. Okay, in the contaminated blood case, Anne Marie got the, the essentials before I went into it. But I worked on a crime case that took me four years before I could document everything that I had guessed was true and that did turn out to be true. Now look, you have to make decisions about how you're gonna spend your time and what you're gonna do with the time you have. It's not limited. Many of you are young, okay, I saw that. Okay, when you're young, you think you have all the time in the world and you're very prone to waste it. You also think that your time is worthless that it's the one resource you can spend like it didn't count. Time is the only resource you never get back. You can't do that many major stories, okay, in a single career. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think Seymour Hirsch has done 100 major stories, maybe a dozen. You have to pick your shots. If the story is not important and it looks difficult, forget it. Let somebody else waste their career. If how much time do I spend digging or investigating to figure out if the story is worth it or possible? Well, I've gotten a lot better at this. Okay. I will, uh, you know, first I will look at the story and if it makes me go, wow, then I'm going to look at whether or not it's doable. Okay. If it's doable, I'm going to assess the knowledge I need the, num the amount of information that's going to be in the public domain and the amount of information that is not. Okay, now, 
I adopted this because I was working in France. I'm a foreigner in France. I learned to speak French, but, but I didn't grow up with inside sources like my competitors. So I became much more skilled at looking for open sources in France, and that enabled me to get some stories that my competitors couldn't. Okay, the more your story can be based on open sources that are available in a library, in an online database, whatever, you know, the more you can reduce the time that's necessary to do the, sort, to do the story. What I will say is this, to answer your question directly, if I see no open sources in a story, I pass. And uh, I had the opportunity to talk to Robbie Robinson, the guy from the Spotlight movie, which everyone here should watch, by the way. It's a great, great movie about investigative journalism. And Robbie said that with his team, when they are assessing the projects they're going to take on, if they do not see a path forward, they toss the story. They let somebody else do it or nobody do it. But they have to see the path forward before they start. Okay, so keep that in mind. The more the story can be based on open sources, the easier it is to do. If it's low importance, but it's easy to do, have some fun. I've done stories that took me two or three days that generated enormous satisfaction, you know, that, that punished people who richly deserved it and made them cough up money to people they'd hurt. That made me feel great. It took two or three days because everything was in the public domain. Okay. If it's of high importance and easy, well, you better get to it before somebody else does. That's all I can say. Don't spend time listening to me, just go out and do the story. Okay, next slide, please. Now, I'm gonna make this easy for you guys. I'm not gonna ask you to, to name your return on investment. Probably, in most cases, I already know. You wanna do this work to punish the wicked, to make the world a better place, to get justice for people who've been denied it. And all of those things are incredibly valuable. I'm with you 100%. But I want you to think about some other things. I want you to think about what kind of skills you are going to acquire doing this story. Will you learn, for example, art market law, as I had to in a crime story? Will you learn judicial procedure? Will you learn about toxicology, as I had to learn for another story? What are you going to learn? And how will that fit into your career? Will you ever use that knowledge again? Are you going into a domain where you want to spend a good piece of your life? If so, you're going to need to acquire a vocabulary, not just sources, but a vocabulary that enables you to speak with those sources. You're gonna to have to do a lot of reading. You're going to have to have some humility and you're going to have to make some money. So why don't you think about the money you're gonna get for doing this work and where it will come from? Who cares enough about this work to pay for it? This by the way is one reason that in recent years, I have met a lot of journalists who have left organizations, including the BBC. In a course I taught in Amnesty, there were four of them in the room, four people from the BBC who went to work at Amnesty because they cared about human rights and they could not get the money at the BBC to do those investigations. Amnesty had the money. Amnesty took them on staff to work on something they cared deeply about. That's a return on investment too. So think about that guys. Think about what's gonna help the world, sure. But I want you to think about what's gonna help you do this work. If you don't get that, the investigation is not worth doing because sooner or later you're gonna go out of business. Okay? Stay in business and get better and better at it. Let's go to the next slide, okay? Now this is absolutely critical. This is an investigative te that technique that is universally used. The quote here is from Sherlock Holmes. The ideal reasoner, when shown a single fact, would deduce what led up to it and what would follow. 
By using that technique, you can solve a great many mysteries. By not using that technique, you make it much harder to understand your stuff. So whenever I start an investigation on anything, the first thing I do is construct a timeline of the events I know about. And by the way, when I worked on the contaminated blood story, the first thing I did was go into a university library, medical university, and put together a timeline of all the research on blood transfusion and AIDS, which mapped out a clear path and also said who knew what when, okay, on the, on the basis of the science. People are doing that now in the COVID epidemic. This is a fundamental tool. It's also a tool for policy or crime because a crime is a scenario. People map out what they're going to do and then they follow it. By the way, if you don't watch Columbo on YouTube, you should. Okay, um, what's, what's my advice on interviewing a psychotic subject or character? Oh my God, stay away from them. And don't interview them in private. Never interview anyone dangerous in private, always in a public place, always. And don't give them any personal information. Don't discuss your girlfriend with them or your boyfriend or, you know, where you like to go for pizza. None of that. I'll just okay. jump in there, um, Mark, just to remind everyone, we've got half an hour at the end of this session for questions uh, like that. So, you know, great questions. But, um, you know, let, let's just keep the flow going and then we'll come back to those questions. Let's do keep the flow going because this is important now. Don't cut away... Uh, don't cut away from uh, the chronology, okay? It's very, very important. Pay attention to this one, guys. It's the single most important technique I know. Okay, let's continue. Next slide. Now this is a generic timeline that was derived from the case of the girl who went blind. How did she get the idea? Well, in some cases, a friend said to her, oh, you would look so cute with purple eyes. How did she get the chance? Advertisements in magazines or on the internet told her where she could get the product. She puts in the contact lenses. Then she wakes up with this infection. What happens then? She got to a doctor. What if she couldn't get to a doctor? That's how girls go blind. And then how do others react? Who is trying to reform this situation? Who else knows about it? Who else finds it absolutely disgusting? These are questions that you can answer provisionally. When we said there must be advertising, we found it everywhere. And the advertisements told us the names of the companies. By exploring the companies, we could see how much money they were making. By looking at the products in the stores, we could see what the product warnings said. Oh, by the way, on this timeline, something's missing. Nobody told her on this timeline that she could go blind. She could buy the product without a prescription. We verified that. When she went into the pharmacy to buy the product, the guy at the counter didn't say, you know, you could go blind. When we looked at the notices inside the boxes, it said, well, yes, there are risks. But when we verified how many people actually read those notices, it's very few. So what this means is that all over the world, there are young women who want to look different for a night, who are buying these products and no one is saying to them, you may not just be pretty, you may be blind. Okay, nobody warning them. And when they get deep in trouble, they've got two hours to sort it out before they're blind. I wouldn't want to be in that situation, and I don't think any of you would either. So look at the technique here, guys. Okay, we start from opportunity, okay? 
we move to the means. Then we see what happens coming away from the central event. In this case, the only central event we're sure of. Then in between each of these questions, we ask other questions and we answer them. And then we verify if that's what happened. You're filling in the spaces between what you know, what you have verified, and what you guess. If X happened, then Y must happen. Before X happened, W must have happened. We think about what condition made an event possible. You know, there's a classic example of this in the history of investigative reporting. You know, uh, when you see a change in policy, a sudden change in policy or behavior in a governmental organization, there's been a meeting. If there was a meeting, there's a record of the meeting. Everyone who is at the meeting will have a copy of that record. Every one of their office assistants will have seen the document. By thinking about how the events would be documented, you can obtain those documents. Anne-Marie Castoret did that in the contaminated blood affair. She knew there was a meeting, she'd heard there was a meeting where the national officials responsible for blood transfusion said, all of our products are contaminated. What are we gonna do with them? Well, we'll sell them to hemophiliacs. Gee, there's a great commercial policy, murder your uh, customers, but that's what they did. And uh, when Anne-Marie heard about the meeting, she figured out when it must have taken place by looking at the changes in policy at the institution that was responsible. And then she went to a guy who she knew must have been at the meeting because of his responsibilities and said, were you there? Is this what you decided? The guy was so terrified he gave her the transcript of the meeting. He later ended up in prison and richly deserved to be there. Whew. In a way, I'm sorry for him, but you know, he was a party to uh, eliminating a lot of people from the earth. Okay, let's continue to the next slide. The next way you can look at this material is as a village. I don't know if any of you grew up in a village. I did, it didn't look like this one, but I grew up in a village. And in that village, everyone knew everyone else. Everyone knew everyone else's business. Everyone knew the first girl or boy you dated, the first time you kissed them, everything. Who left whom? Who got a new job? Who was opening a business? Who got arrested? Yep. And these, uh, these elements were known throughout the village. Now, from an investigative standpoint, each house in the village contains documents. It contains photographs. It contains papers. It contains different things that you want. The house can be big. It could be an institution. Or it could be small. It could be a mother living with a disabled child. But there is something in that house that is in no other house. And in the village, there are houses that will open their doors to you and houses that will close their doors until they realize that everyone else in the village knows and respects you. So what I do when I start an investigation is I draw a little picture like this, and then I put a name on the picture on each house. And then I put what I want to find in the house. This is not just a personal technique. The uh, Organized Crime and Corruption Recording Project has a free software called Visual Investigative Scenarios, VIS, that essentially turns this into a principal map when you're looking at financial investigations. These are general techniques. You cannot avoid this technique. You have to have an idea of where you can find what you need, and that's why you make a map. That's the first reason. 
The second reason is if your data, the information you're gathering, doesn't neatly fit a timeline, it will fit a space map. If you want to see someone who uses this technique with great success, look at the movies of Michael Moore. Any movie but Fahrenheit 9-11, in which he tried to use a timeline, and it, it didn't work as well. We all have an inbuilt preference for one or the other of these structures. That is not important. Eventually, in a long career, you will have to use both. But start with the one you like. My God, you know, it's hard enough to learn. Start with the stuff that you find enjoyable. If you, if you prefer the Odyssey to the Iliad, and you should all read both, by the way, don't think that because they're dead, they don't have any meaning, okay? If you have a preference for one or the other of these, use that preference. Go where you're comfortable to start with. There's always time to go to a place where you're not comfortable. Okay, let's continue to the next slide. Okay, this is just, you know, a little spreadsheet put together to say who matters in the story, what's the house, okay, we call them stakeholders, you know, the lens manufacturer has a company, so he has an office. He's got annual reports, market reports, advertisements in the house. I want them all. They're all public documents. He's going to give them to me. The pharmacist has a shop. POS does not mean piece of shit. It means point of sale. I want to see how he acts when I walk up to his counter and buy a box of these lenses. The government agency has regulations, incident reports. I can probably get most of them online or I can go to their office. And when I go to their office, they're going to look at me and they're going to think, well, this one is a little different. This isn't a monkey asking for a banana. This one's already got some bananas. Maybe we should give him a banana cake. And then they hand over a box of stuff that blows your mind. Yes, it has happened to me. Okay. By showing up and knowing what I was talking about and having already done some research. Then we find our eye specialists, our neutral parties, our experts, who we will find at a conference. Some of the most mind-blowing information I got about prematurely born kids came when I went to a neonatologist conference and watched fights erupt between the people who said, we can't keep raising the level of handicaps among these poor kids just to prove that we're athletes of medicine. It was unbelievable what went down there. And of course, I'd already read the available scholarly studies, so I had an idea who would be at the conference when I showed up. The rest was gravy. Okay, think about this, guys. This is mapping your work. This may sound like extra work to some of you, okay? If your idea of investigation is to go into a darkened underground parking lot and get the whole story from Deep Throat, that's not how it works. If that's the way you work, Deep Throat can lie to you. If you're entirely reliant on secret sources, they can lie to you and you can't do anything about it. Sooner or later, you're going to have to do this work. If you do it first, you will be amazed how many doors open to you because there are so many people out there who are waiting for someone who is not a monkey to show up. They know things they've been wanting to say for years, but they, they didn't think they could ever find a journalist who could understand what they was talking about. If you're that journalist, you are going to get as much stuff as you can handle. Believe me. And that's when you start, that's when, your life starts to change because you become a different kind of person. You become someone who's worth talking to you in a way you weren't before. By the way, if you want to see that transformation in a highly entertaining film, watch Aaron Brockovich with Julia Roberts. Okay, whatever you think of Julia Roberts, I happen to admire her work. Whatever you think of her, you know, that is a perfect portrayal of this process. You will understand it from watching that film. Okay, let's continue. Okay, now this is the last thing I'm gonna tell you and I have five minutes to do it. So 
this woman with her overrun desk is what I looked like 30 years ago. I don't look that way anymore. Here's how. Let's continue. Okay. First, I make a master file. The master file contains everything I'm hearing, excerpts from interviews, excerpts from documents, the timeline, the source map, and uh, with a C, D, uh, Aaron Brockovich with a C. Okay, and the, uh, everything is contained in that document. It can become very long, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that I can find what I've discovered without having it spread all over the map. Of course, I will keep documents in backup files on my hard drive, and I will have those files characterized by, uh, by uh, you know, the type of document it is, academic studies, legal papers, et cetera, okay? But the master file is where I take the elements that I want and put them in. Next slide, please. The master file starts with the hypothesis. Then, next slide, we add in the timeline. Next slide, and then we start putting in illustrations, okay? illustrations, sources, whatever material brings the story home. This, by the way, was from a website in the UK which advertises their products as prescription free. I don't know if any girls have gone blind using those products, but, you know, irresponsible. We didn't interview him for the story because the story was in France. Let's continue. Okay, and then we take quotes. We put that in the master file. Okay, this is a quote from the American uh, Association of Ophthalmologists, American Ophthalmologist Association. And, uh, you know, they came out against selling these things without prescriptions. A very clear and powerful statement from an expert. And uh, imagine calling this person up and saying, hello, Dr. Secor, I'm working on this in France. I saw your statement. Can you tell me why you made that statement, why you felt it was necessary? Did you see people going blind? I found a study that says this many people go blind. Do you know of this study? Do you endorse it? Partly saying things to them to let them know I'm not a monkey. Partly saying things to let them know, yes, you can talk to me. Okay, let's continue. Okay, you get ideas when you're looking at this material. Capture the ideas. Don't say to yourself, I'm gonna remember this. You won't. You will forget it. You'll probably forget your best ideas first. I do. So that's why I write them down, but perhaps you're less manic and stupid than I am. In that case, I congratulate you, but keep writing it down. Next slide. Okay. We, we don't have time to plan these encounters, but what I want to say is when you're preparing for an interview, scenerize the interview. Imagine how the conversation is going to go. Set up the conversation. Don't focus on asking questions. You're not just there for information. You're there to have a conversation. So plan how the conversation will proceed. And by the way, don't be aggressive. And don't accuse the other person because then they no longer have a reason to speak to you. Okay, you, you capture a lot more flies with honey. Okay, so be polite, be kind. You can challenge, but don't be aggressive. Okay, uh, no, slide number 26, please. Let's keep going. Okay, now here's what happens when your research is complete. Take the master file give it another name. I put a date stamp on mine so that I can follow the work I do on the file. Then I read through the file. As I read, I'm taking notes, I'm adding insights, and then I start cutting it back. I take out the stuff I'm not gonna use in the story. I do this over several days, several times. Cutting back, cutting back, cutting back. Every time I rename the file so I don't lose my research. 
when I'm done with the cutting back, meaning when the file is twice as long as the story, I cut and paste the material into the order I'm going to use it. That way, I'm structuring my narrative at the same time I'm reviewing my data. I am not reviewing the data and then making an outline. I am working directly on the information and shaping the structure of the story. Believe me, this is a lot faster than doing it the other way. And it also enables you to absorb the entire story and the work you've done as you're going along. One more slide and we're done. Let's skip down two slides, okay? Okay, if you look at chronology, it doesn't have to be linear starting in the past and going to the future. Okay, even the Greeks knew this. Aristotle said that a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Euripides in Oedipus the King shows us that a story can begin in the present, drop back into the past, and then move forward to the future. So can you. The com most common chronological structure of an investigation is that it begins in the present when we discover a problem, drops into the past to explain the problem, and then moves forward into the future. You can use any one of these structures. Just make sure that you use the one that is easiest when you start. Don't make this job harder, guys. It is already hard. And finally, can we go to one more, uh, one more slide, please? Okay. You're going to find free resources at www.storybasedinquiry.com. You will find this manual. You will find a case book that includes stories from two dozen top investigative journalists in the year 2012. And they not only, did, they not only gave us the story, we paid them for the stories, but not much. They not only gave us the stories, they wrote afterwards explaining how they did it. If there are any freelancers in the room, you have to read the afterwards of Steve Davis and Andrew Jennings, two of the greatest investigative journalists of the, of the 21st century in the UK. Read these things, look at them, see how they did the stories, see what they're telling you, okay? All right, that's it. It's over to me and John Sweeney. I'm only two minutes over and <laughs> I'm going to light a cigarette as we speak because I am in my house and I have the right. You can do what you like in your own home. Absolutely. Okay. Mark, well, but, but thank you. Um, I, oh, I'll, we'll, we'll, let, um, we'll let Mark go and have a smoke and I'll, uh, we'll, we'll put some questions to him in a moment. Uh, but thank you very much. Mark, I hope uh, everyone else appreciated and enjoyed that uh, as much as I did. Uh, I mean, Mark, I just had one quick question at this point. Can you hear me? It, it's just, you know, um, why, why write that manual? I mean, what compelled you to, 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 to put the manual together? What, what, was the, what was the need for a manual? Well, you know, people had asked me to do one before. I did a doctoral thesis on, uh, on investigative methods. And a publisher asked me for such a book, and I thought there's no market for this. Then a couple of things changed. The most important was that the uh, Global Investigative Journalism Network started. And I was at the first meeting in 2001, then 2003. And in 2005, I made a presentation on hypothesis-based inquiry. Okay, and the guys I grew up admiring the men and women I grew up admiring were coming up to me and saying that was amazing. And I thought, what? You know, I thought everybody's doing this. No, they were doing it, but not consciously. That was the first thing. And the second thing was that at that conference, there were hundreds of young people and they were hearing presentations from the greatest in this profession. And I realized that a lot of the presenta presentations were going right over their heads because there was so much tacit knowledge in the, uh, in the presentation. You know, the presentation presumed certain skills and mindsets that were not made articulate, okay? Because people had learned by experience and there was an assumption that experience would teach you. Well, it does, but it takes longer. And 
I thought I'm going to write something that will bridge the gap between the people who are starting out and the people who are in the, who've been in the business and know all of this knowledge. And at that moment, Arab reporters for investigative journalism showed up. They were starting out. They had heard my presentation at uh, the GIJN and they said, we want you to write a manual for us. And that became story-based inquiry. Well, Mark, thank you very much for sharing uh, not only your, your, your method, uh, but also your experience as well uh, this afternoon. At this point, uh, I'm going to bring in our second guest, John. I'm going to just unmute. Oh, you're already well done, John. Uh, well, John Sweeney, welcome uh, to University of Newcastle Civic Journalism Lab this afternoon. Let me just uh, introduce you, John, although you can maybe add some more to this uh, at eulogy. Um, John Sweeney is an investigative journalist who has worked for the Observer newspaper and the BBC's Panorama and Newsnight programmes. He's the author of eight books uh, and his investigation topics have ranged from Scientology to North Korea. Uh, John's investigative reporting helped clear the names of five mothers wrongly accused of killing their children who had in fact died of caught death and that work won John the Paul Foote Award and a Royal Television Society Award. John, uh, welcome. May uh, I just say something here? Please. John, I knew you were a distinguished reporter, but saving people beats hammering people every time. Congratulations for great work. Thank you. <laughs> John, uh, you've had a chance just to, um, to listen to Mark's um, method and his advice. Um, what, what do you think of, of, of the inquiry, uh, inquiry, uh, as Americans say, method? I mean, is it, is it, uh, is it something that you're aware of using? Um, yeah, what, what, what did you think, John? Um, I, I think, well, hey, listen, I think I, would, I could do a, a damn sight better if I'd used that uh, <laughs> technique, but I haven't. But you kind of, there is, um, so I'm a practitioner and I have, uh, essentially I have hunches, which is a kind of a, a cheap um, pound shop version of the hypothesis. And, um, and you get off on a hunch and you kind of see, look, is, where's the evidence? And it, I'm kind of like, <laughs> if um, I'm much more of a Neanderthal and I go around sort of bashing my head against brick walls, until either I walk away and thinking my my head hurts, or the brick wall kind of falls down. Um, but essentially, I think um, if I gave it some thought, yes, I I I actually follow um, well, what um, what was set out there, which is that that you do have a hypothesis, and what you're looking for is strong evidence um, or, or something. Now, the, the other thing that I, um, that I look for, and someone else um, said this, I don't want to claim authorship to it, but I look for anomalies. I look for something that's, uh, that's missing. And so um, I'm, um, uh, the other day uh, for Byline Times, I've, um, I've just done a piece about John Whittingdale. Now he's the Minister of State of the Culture Department and in 2016, he was a culture secretary. And there was a story which was on, um, at this time I was working for BBC for Newsnight. And the story had appeared first in byline, um, byline.com um, and two separate journalists, first Nick Much and then uh, a guy called Jim Kusick, who used to work for The Independent on Sunday, both ran this story. Then it was followed up in Private Eye. Here's the anomaly, is that um, some years before, something like 2012, John Whittingdale had taken his then wife to the MTV Awards in, I think, Copenhagen. And um, it's the fancy awards, a flight, a hotel, the tickets for the awards do, and something like a thousand pounds. And he'd registered it with the parliamentary register of interests. He then took another woman he divorced his wife and took another woman, his then girlfriend, to the MTV Awards in Amsterdam, but didn't register it. So there's the anomaly. I had no, 
interest that the woman he took turned out to be a sex worker, um, a Miss Whiplash, a dominatrix. But the Prime Minister's then press secretary, a guy called Craig Oliver, and he, he writes about it um, in this book, Unleashing Demons, which is actually a really fascinating book. But the anomaly, um, I was, why did the minister, the then Secretary of State for Culture, John Whittingdale, in charge, his responsibility in charge of the BBC, why did he register the trip with the parliamentary register with the, with the, other, um, um, with the other woman, the, the dominatrix, it turned out? And it so happens that Whittingdale's uh, then um, uh, SPAD special advisor in British terms um, is a woman called Carrie Simmons. Now we all know who she is. She's the partner of, um, of Boris Johnson. But she writes the, um, the response to an email I send asking why the anomaly and um, what, <laughs> what Craig Oliver writes in his book and there's also an audio version of it. And it's really funny is that uh, uh, he just writes it deadpan in the book. John Whitt Whittingdale is confident, uh, is sure of the fact that he had no idea that he was dating a, um, um, a prostitute who specialized in sadomasochism. <laughs> that, that sentence is a death sentence for a cabinet minister. What, you know, dear God, he ought to know about this. And what happened was that a couple of um, months later, the referendum happens, Cameron falls, um, Theresa May um, becomes the new prime minister, and Whittingdale is out. One of the first people who comes back in again under Boris Johnson when he becomes prime minister again last summer, John Whittingdale returns to the culture department as uh, Minister of State of Culture. And then there's a whole series of questions, some of which I looked at at the BBC, and we they didn't, the bosses didn't transmit um, the story. And this, essentially the story is, uh, and all concerned in any wrongdoing, that Whittingdale took uh, essentially benefits in kind from trips, I think five trips to Kiev and two trips to, um, to Vienna, um, courtesy of the, the uh, Firtash, um, sorry, courtesy of the British Ukrainian Society whose office, and this is the point folks, this is what you've got to look for, whose office had the same address as the Dmitry Firtash um, group, which is um, a, a, a massive company run by a, a Soviet-born oligarch called Dmitry Firtash. And the thing about Dmitry Firtash, um, thanks to WikiLeaks, we know this, but in 2010, and an American ambassador reported, or rather the story broke in 2010, um, a, an American ambassador to Ukraine interviewed Firtash, had a session with him, and Firtash said, according to the ambassador, Firtash denies saying this, that when he started up in business, Firtash actually was dealing, had to deal, had to um, um, be in a business relationship with a man called Semyon uh, Mogilevich, who's, who's the brainy Don, the Teflon Don, who is Russia's still at large Al Capone all concerned in any wrongdoing. This story is up on um, uh, byline times under a thing called Sweeney Investigate. So the story is this, is that there's this minister, uh, John Whittingdale, who was disgraced in 2016, thanks in part to a story I pushed and gone on to BBC Newsnight. He falls from grace and then he's back again in power and remember monitoring my old organization, the BBC, and saying you're not doing well enough. But this guy, has received something like fifteen thousand pounds from a um, from an NGO, a, a non-governmental organisation, the British Ukrainian Society, which shares the same address as um, as this um, as the Dmitro Firtash group. The other thing you want to know about Firtash is he's uh, the FBI wants to extradite him to the United States for corruption. So um, it's an interesting story. Now. The, the, um, like, what's the hypothesis? The hypothesis is simple, is that there are big question marks about the judgment of this minister, John Whittingdale, because he is, he is open to uh, sex compromise, people would say. So, for example, my source of this is the former uh, um, press secretary to the British Conservative Prime Minister, David Cameron. It's in his book. Um, 
But secondly, there is a kind of slightly murky financial relationship with this oligarch who the FBI want to extradite the United States. So that's the story. The difficulty is, um, or my difficulty as an investigative journalist at the BBC, was getting this relationship between Whittingdale and Dmitry Firtash on air. Um, I didn't succeed. I didn't succeed. Now, at the time, Whittingdale was in a position of, of um, semi-disgrace because of, of the whiplash affair, which is less interesting than his relationship with Dimitro Firtash. Anyway, so that's the sort of flavor of it. I'm dead keen on um, uh, doing the questions with the, um, um, with the students because all sorts of fun can, can come from that. But um, have you got a couple of other questions? By the way, one factual check, I've written 12 books. 12 books, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of Wikipedia. I've got, to, I've got to go into it. I've written four novels, um, some of, one of which has worked, the other three, two of which have worked in a cell world, two of which haven't. Showbiz, hey? <laughs> well, apologies for that, um, John. Um, so just, just one, other, I mean, one other thought at this point, because we, um, Mark showed us that um, sort of X, Y axis of, you know, deciding what what makes a story important or how easy, I mean, wh how, do, how do you select or how have you selected your stories? Because again, Mark talked about, um, you know, making sure that we, we put our time and effort into only those stories that are going to give us that return on investment that we need. I mean, what, how have you made those kind of choices over the years? I think as a storyteller, the most powerful stories are the stories powerful people do not want told. So um, I, um, I like staying in bed and I like going to the pub. The only thing that really gets me out of bed in the morning and keeps me out of the, the pub in the evening is when I get a letter from Carter Ruck or Shillings or um, Mishkon Daraya um, telling me, don't say this. Now, the... Um, um, I left the BBC in, in, a, in a frankly annoying fashion. Um, we had a disagreement, but I, I fell for a sting by somebody who was working for Tommy Robinson. It's all up on YouTube. It was quite nasty. But I was um, um, effectively hunted by his supporters online and also in person. It was very, very difficult, and I don't think the BBC bosses supported me. They and I disagree about that. Um, then um, what happens is my... There's a wonderful Maltese blogger called Manuel Delia who wanted, um, he, was, he wanted to write a book about Daphne Caruana Galizia, the great investigative journalist who was blown up by a car bomb in uh, October 2017, and I've written lots of books. So Manuel, I interviewed Manuel because I did a piece of which I'm very proud about um, Malta's Shame, which is up on YouTube. And um, um, I... Um, with an Italian journalist who's very, we've got some fantastic sources inside the Italian police and the Italian intelligence who were investigating um, mafia, Italian mafia corruption and connections with the Maltese mafia. The three of us wrote this book about Daphne and it was um, a great um, pleasure in this uncomfortable year I had last year to do a proper job of journalism and help my Maltese colleague and my Italian colleague sort of tell the story in English. They actually knew the story better than I did, but what I was doing was converting it from there, um, turning it into English, English, if you like. And uh, part of the joy of that was getting, um, getting letters. Um, when I was at the BBC, I got a letter from Shillings. Shillings is a fancy law firm, all concerned, deny any wrongdoing. And they, you know, they, there was a, a bank called Pilatus Bank, um, run by a guy called Ali Sadra. He's Iranian, Iranian-born, but he's got a passport from St. Kitts, which is a microdot island somewhere in the Caribbean. You know, uh, coconut trees and great rum, but not very good ethics. So what's an Iranian doing with a St. Kitts passport? And, and this is a question that uh, Daphne Caruana Galizia asked, and then, lo and behold, I asked some questions of the bank. For example, my favorite thing about Ali Sadra was he was born twice. One of the great opennesses of um, British democracy is the company's house. And if you look him up, Ali Sadra, you see that the Pilates Bank, 
there's this guy, and he's born as a kid, so he's got an Iranian name, Ali Sadra, there's more of it, and then St. Kitts. And that, there's your anomaly straight there. You know, what, what, why? And he's got two dates of birth. He was born in 73 and then in 1980. Hold on a second. You can't be born twice. That's just crazy. Then you get the letter from Schillings. Eventually, what happens is um, after Daphne um, dies, we find out that um, the banker, uh, Ali Sadra, is suing Daphne in Arizona, a state she's never visited, for $40 million for, um, for libel. And this is kind of like a secret court case. Nobody knows about it. The case drops. Um, eventually, uh, the Maltese authorities, under pressure from the, from the European authorities, close down Pilatus Bank, and then the FBI arrest Ali Sadra. Um, he's tried and convicted. And then just the other day, um, um, the Department of Justice say the trial is unfair and um, we're going to, um, we want to drop the case and this is now going through the courts. So as I said at the very beginning, all concerned deny any wrongdoing. There is of course no suggestion. Um, well actually this is difficult because Ali Sadras has been convicted of a crime that the Department of Justice are now going. So all of this means you've got to be wary but at the same time the answer to your question is a simple one. If somebody powerful says you shut up, or they say to poor people who are afraid, who are afraid to speak, who may actually not be very articulate or sometimes um, get their messages, get their, uh, their storytelling confused, there's still a story there. They're still decent people. And what's, why are they afraid? And is, is there a story underlying there? And that's the thing that, that excites me, that gets me going. And just, and I'm, I'm going to just say to our, our audience, uh, I mean, th this is a good time now to put your questions for John and also for Mark into the, the chat, and then I'll, I'll put those questions to them. Um, but it, just, just what, one th thought while um, they're doing that, uh, John, I mean, I often say to my students, because we, 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 we teach our students, obviously, a little bit of media law, but I often tell them to see the law as their friend as much as a threat. I mean, I, I, have you found that to be the case that a good knowledge of the law give you, actually gives you courage? You know, ra, you know, when you see those letters come in, actually because you are knowledgeable <laughs> and experienced, actually you know the law can be there to protect you as an investigative journalist. Yes, so um, I've got at some point, um, um, I've, I've got a small apartment uh, here in Italy, and I plan to wallpaper um, the upstairs bathroom with letters from Carter Ruck in relation to the Church of Scientology. Uh, as you, uh, you may know, look it up. But if you look up me screaming at the Church of Scientology, it's a 40 second clip. Can I ask that you also look up the whole um, half an hour documentary? It's only 30 minutes. It's called. Scientology and me, and if you're really interested in cults, I've written a book about it, which is called um, Scientology, the Church of Fear, you can get on Amazon. But essentially, um, I have got a ton of letters from, um, from Carter Ruck, and all the time they're threatening, 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 but they don't actually want you to go to court, because essentially, um, they don't want to lose. And now what they can do, um, is they can get you on things like copyright breaches that's an anxiety and separately um they can get you on process and now um, and i had a wonderful lawyer at the uh, bbc roger law um uh, blessings be upon him and um now that i'm um doing stuff for byline times um i there's a very good lawyer there and what we have is a to and fro is that I propose something and a good lawyer will come in and say, don't say that. <laughs> but, and then you, you put your head in your hands and say, well, why can't I say that? So we just can't say that. And then the, good law, then the good lawyer says, but how about saying this? And so but what you get is a fascinating conversation where, and what you do do, and what is fair and proper and right and decent is to give um, the, um, the person you're looking at a fair shout, i.e. Uh, you write to them and say, we're going to propose, I'm going to say this about you, what do you, what do you, um, what do you say? And, um, uh, and that's proper and fair and the right thing to do. Now, 
and it, it actually also makes you safe because what you're doing, um, a simple test of law in any good jurisdiction in the world is, have you done, have you done something which, which others would look at and say fair and reasonable? So what you want to do if you're doing an investigation is that, is that you, uh, by the way, you may say um, something silly or write something silly um, on the internet. Now that's foolish. What you, would, what you should try and do is keep an open mind and certainly in terms of emails and also on Twitter, it's very, very difficult this because part of the joy of Twitter and all the rest of it is saying what you think, but actually that can show that your mind's a bit prejudiced. So occasionally what you've got to do is actually stand back and say, no, this is, this is the whole thing. And in any story of any complexity, it's proper to give the, the, the target, if you like, what the target, uh, what the target says and um, set it out in, uh, in fairness. Now, some of the time that can be, um, your target can just end up abusing you. So the Church of Scientology used to call me a bigot, a liar, and a psychopath. Thank you very much. Um, Aaron Banks, uh, I've done quite a few stories about him. He's the, uh, the Brit who is married to a Russian uh, woman, um, and he, um, he gave Britain's biggest political donation ever, £8 million to leave.eu. And I did a story for Newsnight, it was one of the last stories I did, which said that he owned, which we found out uh, from information he gave to the BBC, but not me, somebody else in the BBC who passed it on to me, uh, us, my team at Newsnight. And um, we found out that he owned a company called Ural Properties, which was registered in Gibraltar. And we found some uh, clever diggers on the internet, the film's up there. Um, and they um, uh, eventually got hold of the records from the Gibraltar registry and found that Ural Properties, Aaron Banks' film, uh, firm, company, owned two flats overlooking the Royal Naval Base in Portsmouth. Now the issue is, is Mr. Banks some kind of, um, um, is he, has he got snow on his boots? Is he, you know, is he, he's been to see the Russian ambassador on a number of occasions, married to a Russian woman, he's got a company called Ural, Ural Properties, and so, and guess what? They've got two flats overlooking the Portsmouth Naval Base. Isn't that a coincidence? And Aaron Banks on Twitter the other day, Aaron Banks had a go at me and said that I was, um, he said I was sacked from the BBC, that's not true. And he went on to say that I was more slippery um, than a snake on a stripper's pole. And, and I had to, um, and, and I replied to Mr. Banks, I fear that you might be confusing me with your wife, um, who according to the New Yorker, um, had been um, uh, deported from Dubai, or um, uh, left Dubai um, after the authorities found that she was a common prostitute. And the New Yorker has the paperwork to say that. And since that moment, Mr. Banks hasn't said anything rude about me uh, at all on Twitter. So this is, by the way, this isn't formal legal advice here. Folks. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, I'd like to make a comment on this, okay? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I think it's very important to do is that in whatever your jurisdiction you're working in, you have to have a working knowledge of libel law. John made reference to being fair, okay? In any jurisdiction I know of, um, one of the criteria is, did you act in good faith? There are other criteria as well, but every couple of years, you know, I take a look at the latest judgments from the French libel courts, because these judgments don't just tell me what I can't do. They tell me what I can do if I respect certain rules, if I follow certain procedures and check off the dots. And like John, I've had more or less long meetings with uh, libel lawyers. And I would, I would like to say that, you know, one of the things that gets your side excited about defending you and going to the wall for you is if you can actually prove what you said. So having the material ready to go and not taking longer than, you know, 30 seconds or a minute to pull out the document that proves what you're saying is something that gets them very excited. They think we're going to kick Carter Ruck's ass. Let them come. 
you know, let them, uh, let them flap and moan and send off their letters. But uh, you want to know where the lines are and you want to try to stay on one side of those lines. Sometimes you make more or less risky decisions, but you have to know what the risks are. Yes, it's fun. Um, what I like to do is to remember the detail of the cases or of the evidence. And so when you're in a legal meeting, um, you just say, yes, you've got a good point there, were it not for this piece of information? And then you hit them, bang, and, um, and you've got it. And then, and I'm a bit cocky as well, so I can remember when I was in the Observer, um, um, having a go at a, um, at a night lawyer, these are the, um, uh, who turns out now, who's now an eminent QC, and I say, um, have you been a lawyer for long? <laughs> so, but yes, but, uh, the, in a weird way, the law can be our friend. Now, Daphne was persecuted. Um, she, she suffered, um, she had 42 libel actions and five criminal libel cases. And, and she was a, a one woman band. She was extraordinarily brave. And part of the problem with somebody in her position is that you, um, you don't have an organization that kind of looks after you, that kind of filters, that sort of slows you down. And in some ways, what I'm doing now is, um, is more difficult because I, I miss the BBC as a wonderful platform. And also it's an organization in which I've got to make the argument and push it through. But at the same time, that became more and more, uh, that relationship became more and more difficult. But yes, the law, the law is your friend. Okay, thank you both. Uh, let's, let's go to some of these questions uh, that we're getting. And please, if you've got a question, put it into the, the meeting chat. Um, this one's from Mark, from, from Mary. Uh, Mark, you mentioned doors opening once you have all the documents and information from the public domain. But if you're investigating a powerful corporation or company, what level of management general worker should you begin with? Would this depend on the actual documentation or information that you have? I would not start with the management of the company. I would start with people who are working around them. I actually had a case like this that came up at INSEAD. We were doing a, a study of the, of the biggest consumer boycott that ever happened in France. And, you know, it had gone on for months. And then the company management stood up at the annual shareholder meeting and said it had no effect on us. And this had been, this line was adopted by the ensemble of the French media. A miracle has occurred. And I thought, how did the miracle occur? So my working hypothesis was they pulled off a miracle. Now I've got to see how it happened. And I discovered it wasn't a miracle. They'd been gravely affected. And the key source was, uh, the key source was financial analysts who have better access to company data and better means for analyzing it than I do. And what they said basically was the company lied. And when they found that the company lied, they punished it by nearly putting it out of business as an independent company. They drove down the stock price hugely and predators moved in. Eventually the company was saved by the French government, long live free market capitalism. <laughs> but uh, in any case, we didn't show the work to the company until we documented all of that. And then we sent it over to them and said, wouldn't you like to tell us what, what, what you think this means? And they came back and said, well, yeah, and, you know, we had meetings with, you know, a number of people there, but I, I would not, uh, I would not move on uh, the management of a company until I had documented a certain set of actions, policies, or attitudes that they needed to, uh, that they needed to justify or, or show. Okay. I mean, look, I've worked in business schools a lot. Okay. And what I've realized is that the responsibility of corporate management is not to tell the truth to everybody who asks for it. It's to protect the organization and their own careers. That's how they see it. So, okay, I can, I can accept that. That's just the way it is. But I am not going to 
use them as a primary source until I have significant material to show them. And at that point, it's a question of who had their hands closest to the thing. Generally, the best people to talk to are not workers or top management, it's middle management. Because those are the people who carried out the policies, who got the orders, and who probably didn't like what they had to do. You know, you have to think in terms, as MI6 put it, okay, a former head of MI6 told me this, you think in terms of the quality of the information, the access to the information, and the motivation for giving you the information, okay? The people who meet those three criteria the most are the people in the middle of the pyramid. They have better access than the ones on the bottom, unless you're talking about really tough union officials, okay? They have better access than the people on the bottom. They have access to high quality information because they got the orders. They may have seen the studies. They may have been shown PowerPoints and uh, they don't like what they're seeing. It may have made their lives worse. It may have made the company worse. It may have had all kinds of effects. So Mary, I hope that's useful to you, but you know, that's how I proceed. John, I mean, I'm, I, I'm guessing John, well, I know you, you've, you've come up against many organizations over the course of uh, your career. Have you found any particular uh, roots into the organization successful or does it very much depend on the story? Uh, legal cases are useful um, because um, you can dig out if somebody's suing somebody sometimes if you go through the, uh, the detail of it you can find interesting information. Um, I, the America is more open than Britain um, so that so that some it's hard to get um, disclosure. Another problem is that a lot of a lot of targets these days um, elect to base them, uh, their business as private. It's not public, uh, not public companies. And um, if it's private, then often um, you start finding um, a paper trail that goes through places like Gibraltar, the Cayman Islands, um, and, and, and trust and becomes more and more difficult to work, to work out what's going on. Um, fantastic, there's been some fantastic leaks. Uh, so the, um, um, uh, the Panama Papers, fantastic stuff um, from Mossack Fonseca and, and included in that was this uh, extraordinary story that Daphne Caruana Galizzi got that, that uh, essentially the um, fabulously corrupt um, royal family of Azerbaijan um, sent uh, a million pounds to a very shell company to a woman who so happened to be the wife of the Maltese Prime Minister, uh, Joseph Muscat, all concerned, deny any wrongdoing. So there is, you, you can do some, um, you can go at these companies, um, sometimes it's very difficult, and then there's a leak and then something comes out. It's quite fun um, living long um, because there are, there are stories there are, so, for example, I had to go to the Barclay Twins, who are the people around the Telegraph, and they had a real go at me. Um, and I was in 96. I was convicted in France for criminal libel by a French court against the Barclay Twins. Just the other day, it came out in London um, that a, um, the, the two twins, and they're, very, they're in their 80s, um, one side, rather, the, uh, the sons, um, this is the evidence of a court case, um, the sons of Sir David Barclay are accused of bugging Sir Frederick Barclay and his daughter. And um, Sir Frederick's evidence is um, Sir David's youngest son appearing to plan to bug on, on, um, at the Ritz Hotel to bug Sir Frederick. So there's a fantastic moment that yes, I um, I, I was um, I've got a I lost this criminal libel case against me in in France in the 90s brought by the twins. Now it seems they're falling out badly. So I'm, I'm looking forward to working on the story uh, at some time in the future. Okay, may I uh, respond to a question from Refat? Yeah, of course. Day. Yeah, go for uh, okay. it. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, Refat says that. Uh, there are no open sources 
available in certain countries. Rifat, I have to disagree with you. And uh, I had the pleasure of working with uh, Hamoud Alamoud, who was one of the pillars of Arab reporters for investigative journalists coming out of Syria and is now the editor-in-chief of the Harvard Business Review in that region. Okay, and Hamoud was an expert on open sources. And, you know, throughout my career, I, you know, I've worked in a lot of different places. And people always say to me, oh, you're an American, you have open sources. Well, yes, but the real truth is that there are always more open sources that, than you know of, okay, before you start looking. Um, and I will never forget being in a room full of Syrian journalists with Hamoud. And he said to them, read the official journal. The official journal, I don't know what you call it in the UK or, or where you're based, Rifat. You know, in France, it's the record of, gover of government acts. And Hamoud said to them, read the official journal every day. Okay, and they were saying, these are just official lies and all of that. And, and Hamoud said, no, there are certain things they have to publish to keep the government working. This is only one example, but there are always more sources of data than you know of. Now, you are talking about war crimes and crimes against humanity and conflict zones in the Middle East. There may not be information related to those crimes, okay, in official records, of course, but the, import, but the nomination of people who oversaw those policies, that would be in the official journal. Okay, the allocation of resources in budgets under certain lines, not all, everybody has secret lines as well, but certain allocations would be announced. You can find a number of things. And one of the things that distinguishes an investigative journalist from a news reporter is the investigative journalist develops a repertoire of open sources. You learn certain places that you can go to to find out certain things. And by the way, you should not be trying to do this all on your lonesome. There are research institutes that are specialized in all kinds of places. They have libraries. In those libraries live angels called librarians who are absolutely expert at knowing what kinds of information are published from different sources and guiding you to that. I mean, I relied a lot on libraries. And I still do, in fact. And, you know, think about that. Think about what kind of stuff a government has to publish in order to keep functioning. And you will eventually find more material than you thought was there. Perhaps not in the specific zone you're looking for, and perhaps not a lot, but in general, yes. Uh, thank you, Mark. I mean, John, you've worked, I guess, primarily in the UK, but your investigations have taken you to the United States and also to North Korea. I mean, I can't imagine there's an awful lot of open sources uh, in North Korea, but I mean, to tell I mean, what, what did you rely on there for that additional information beyond what your sources were telling you? Are you asking me? Sorry, no, I'm putting that to John. Sorry, I'm putting that to, oh, okay. to John, Mark. Yeah, well, so the thing in North Korea is the, uh, the great source of information of North Koreans who've left. Um, and so what you do is you go to South Korea, weirdly, um, there, is, there, is a North, there is a Korean community in uh, New Malden, which is just the south of Wimbledon. And within that North Korean community, there are about, oh, sorry, South Korean community, um, which is maybe um, 1,000, 2,000 strong, because nearly all the uh, Koreans in Britain have ended up um, there. There's about 50 or so North Koreans. These are defectors who've ended up um, in, um, um, in Britain, and they're fascinating. And their stories, um, they've got books, they've stories. Also, um, there are quite a few defectors, but there are many more defectors, obviously, in South Korea, so that's one way of doing it. So um, Mary, is it Maria Zani who's asked um, a yes. question about, um, I wanted to, um, to reflect something, which is, I, I did a, um, a story, again, this is, um, a, 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 well, it was a grim story, 99, um, after NATO bombed Belgrade, um, there was 
the Milosevic Serbs um, piled into Kosovo, uh, they were already there, in 99 and um, set about murdering the Albanian Kosovar um, population to effect ethnic cleansing. Um, roughly 10,000 or so, slightly more, I think, uh, people were, were killed. And there was a particular massacre in a place called Little Krusha, Krusha Rebogl in Albanian, Krusha um, Male in Serbian. And um, more than 100 men and boys were taken to a, hen bar, uh, a hay barn and machine gunned. Um, 106 uh, men and boys were killed. But there were a couple of survivors. There were, I think, six survivors. And I did a film um, and um, a story for the Observer. And that essentially, the film was my attempt, still inside Albania, where all the refugees had fled, roughly a million people had fled to Albania, um, and to find these survivors. And one of them I heard about had burnt hands. Um, he, he burnt his hands. And because the Serbs, after the killing, had set the hay barn on fire, and this man was still alive underneath the dead um, bodies of his um, brothers and uncles. And he waited. He didn't want to, to run too early, so he waited until um, the flames were almost killing him, and then he made a run for it. And eventually, inside Albania, I found this man, Mehmet Krasnitsi, and um, he and I uh, both gave evidence of the Hague against the Serb generals who had uh, ordered this. Now, the piece of evidence I found was that um, in the, that summer, NATO went into Kosovo and the Serb military left. And I went into the, um, the Serb houses with, and we were on film and I found uh, some evidence. Critically, I found a, ro a roster with Serb names on it, um, a long list of like 30 names, three teams, um, and this was the, the militia, militia watch. Now these people had been identified, or some of them had been identified by the survivors of the massacre as the killers. And they were paid by the Ministry of Defense or the Ministry of the Interior in Belgrade. And my evidence enabled the Hague to link uh, the generals at the top, if you like, with the killers on the ground. And the thing is that um, eventually um, the Kosovars came back from refuge in Albania and came back, and the KLA um, came back, the uh, Kosovo uh, Liberation Army, as they call it, Uchika, yeah, in, Albanian, in Albanian. And one of the first things they did was they set fire to the Serb homes. Now, there was nobody in them, but this was arson. And we put this in the film. So that when I was accused of being too pro-Kosovo, too, too pro-Albanian um, um, in my storytelling, I said, well, that's not fair, is it? Because if you look at the film, you can see that we put in um, the arson you can see the burning Serb homes. So this was a piece of um, evidential fairness, um, which was in that film. And we won a, an art, a Royal Television Society and an International Emmy for those films. This year in January, just before COVID lockdown, I was, um, 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 uh, I gave evidence in a court case um, in Kosovo because one of the Serb killers had traveled across Kosovo on a false, false, false passport and the Kosovo police arrested him and he was tried locally. He's not a Serb general, not one of the big guys. He was one of the killers. And again, his defense said, aren't you just biased against us? And I said, no, because if you look at the film, you could see that we put the evidence of the Uchika, the KLA burning the Serb homes. So, um, um, because because oh, Maria, yeah, Maria's question really is is you know how can you make us when you're doing an investigation, um, you know, and uh, in this case about past war crimes, I mean, how can you possibly make it balance? But maybe maybe what we're saying is maybe balance is the wrong word. Maybe it's fairness. I mean, I, I don't know. Am I, am I, am I 
getting yes, at the heart I'm, of it. I'm, I'm, I'm uneasy with balance because balance is like that. And it feels like sort of your, um, if you're talking about war crimes, you're talking about a, uh, essentially the Milosevic controlled army that in Kosovo in 99 killed 10,000 people. So that balance is wrong. It, you know, the story is pretty bleak. The KLA did bad stuff too. Um, you can make an argument that they, it, it wasn't, it was a reaction, a defense, um, and, but they killed Serbs. And the current prime minister of, um, of Kosovo, Hashim Vaci, is now in trouble because he's facing a, um, um, a warrant for the arrest from the war crimes tribunal in The Hague. So, so he's in, in, in trouble too, but balance, I, I'm always uncomfortable with it. I think you've got to be fair, and I think you've got to do something else as well, is that you've got to reflect um, the arguments of whoever you're challenging, and that's a fair and proper thing. And twice now, I've been able to say in court, no, um, what I did was fair, look at this. Um, and the guy, um, um, the man who I gave evidence against in January has just been convicted and sentenced to something like, um, um, he, he's got a very long sentence. I'll um, put a link to the story on this chat um, when, I've, when I've done. So yeah, um, you, you've got a duty to the truth. That's most important of all. Now, obviously, in something like this, the truth can be very, very partial. And you can say, you know, it was wrong for the um, um, for NATO to bell, uh, bomb Belgrade. But at the same time, the, the numbers of people who actually killed um, um, by um, the bombers um, in Belgrade was, was very small. I think um, it wasn't a high number. I don't want to, to speculate, but it was, it was certainly less than 20 compared to more than 10,000 killed by the uh, killed in the reaction so you've got to have a sense yeah. sense of this but this is very very difficult and it's very very challenging but always in my experience i um, worked with um, albanian translators kosovo translators who were happy to tell me quietly sometimes off camera um, their anxiety suspicions about what their own side was going up to and equally uh, serve translators, serve fixers, serve journalists who were, um, uh, who were happy or not happy but would tell me about what was going on, on the other side but you've got to be careful with this information because the idea that, um, that all information is um, it, it's a very very Anglo-Saxon thing to think that information has no cost, that free speech is free. Now, actually, Trump is, is kind of teaching uh, the United States a grisly lesson um, in that. And we're beginning to, um, America is beginning to realize you know, the battle for honest news um, isn't, it's by no means over. It's by no means over. Um, but that's another, it's another yeah. international. Yeah. No, it, it's a thing that really angers me because I think that what Trump has done by talking about fake news is that he made all of our jobs more difficult and more dangerous. And for example, I think that Khashoggi would not have been murdered by, uh, by the Saudi, by Saudi um, intelligence people fundamentally working for the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, also known as Mr. Bonesaw. They wouldn't have done that had the man in the White House, the President of the United States, not be so contemptuous of what we do. Uh, that's a serious allegation, but I make it. Yeah. Thank you, um, John. Another question from Mary. What happens when a story goes cold? For example, if the story is about wrongdoing, was the intention of telling the story to bring legal actions against the perpetrators, get things changed uh, for health reform, or just to inform the world. Now, I'm not sure, is Mary talking about a specific um, uh, story there? But, but anyway, I think the general question is, yeah. what happens when an investigation goes cold? Is, is that telling us something? Uh, well, Mark? The, you know, one of, the, one of the issues there is whether the effects of the story are still visible. Okay, we're speaking about wrongdoing here. Did the, did the wrongdoing leave any traces? Are there survivors? Are there uh, costs? Are there things that were not fixed that should have been fixed? If that is the issue, 
then uh, the story has not gone cold. If the story is no longer uh, actually, uh, shall I say, hot, okay, then you simply put the thing together, you keep track of the people who are involved in it, and when there's a news break involving them, you bring it out again, okay, which is essentially what John did with this Minister of Culture. And by the way, John, I did the same thing with the Minister of Culture in France a couple of times, <laughs> you know, just to, just to have fun with him after he uh, had me blacklisted in the country. You know, it's so much fun to remind them that you haven't been shut up. But in any case, uh, in any case, there will always be some trace that persists to the present. Find that trace and you can hang the story on it. Either it's a news break or it's something that was never settled, that hasn't gone to sleep, if you will. Um, I don't know what the specific story is, uh, what the specific story is, Mary, but you know, if it's something really horrendous, you know, you're gonna find those traces, okay? There's also a question from Inia about what do you do when sources and materials become abundant? Well, they always do, Inia. You know, but the, the time to, the question isn't how you narrow down the research materials. The question is how you narrow down the angle of attack on the story. You know, uh, one of the smartest things I ever heard about this came from a guy named Declan Hill who wrote a wonderful book about match fixing. And Declan says that when he starts out on a story, he writes in one sentence what the story is about. Okay, it's, it's his way of doing a hypothesis. And Declan says that what's great about that is that by saying what the story is about, you're also saying what it's not about. So if you're doing a profile in Kashmir or Venezuela, what about Kashmir or Venezuela? That's too large. You know, you're, you're not gonna do a Wikipedia entry. What you're going to do is pick one aspect of that situation of that you know, country, whatever. And you're going to, you know, say something that hasn't been said about that place. Otherwise, it's not worth doing the story. You know, so do that work going in. Define the story before you start the research, because no matter how narrow the angle is, there's going to be a lot of it. And then keep track, okay, of that research as you're compiling it. It'll be, it'll be too late after uh, after you've already made the pile okay i hope yeah. that answers your question thank you mark and just i think w one final question well actually it's gonna i'm gonna amalgamate two or three questions here because i think they're probably about this roughly the same thing but it's really about if you're working at sanget and sanjana if you're working independently how do you keep the powerful bodies whether that's government police or i think sanjana mentions terrorist organizations or, or, or criminal gangs. I mean, how do you continue to investigate when perhaps intimidation uh, or sabotage may be a real, a real possibility? Um, you know, I, I guess maybe the question is also, at what point do you say this, the return on investment here is not great enough or do you ply on? I mean, John, I don't know if, I mean, do you want to kick that one off? Yeah, you've got to worry. Um, you've got to... Uh, generally, politicians are fair game in, um, in democracy. So politicians are easier. Um, but the moment you, um, you move focus... Um, so, so, for example, I'm fascinated. I've been to Belarus once. I went there. Um, I didn't declare I was a journalist, so I was there effectively undercover, and I'd written a little book about Lukashenko is this um, crook and strong man who's been in power forever there. And he's a, a brutal and stupid thug um, who uh, has historically locked up the opposition and tortured them. And it's possible that this time, um, a, three opposition leaders, all of whom are women might overthrow him. But doing a story there, if you're a Belarusian is very, very difficult. On the other hand, if you're I mean, uh, you're all in a happy position of being uh, student journalists and therefore haven't got much baggage with you. So you could, you know, pop on a um, uh, fly to uh, um, 
fly to Poland and sort of and, and get across, uh, get a visa, go on holiday, a tourist holiday, and then um, you get to Belarus, get to Minsk, and ask questions and, and do stuff. I'm not uh, advising you to do this. I think it's a fascinating story, but there's a downside in that this guy, the man in charge, is a thug and a bully. So you've, you, you've got to you've got to work it through. So I think I think my my sensible advice is you should start doing stories where the risk is is runnable absolutely and, and 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 the thing is if you and then to be honest once you've uh, if you've got a job you've got, you're working for an organization or that you find um somebody who's going to look after you um, i.e so you can still be freelance but if you're working for a good um, um you you can plug into a team or you've got an employer who's going to look after you and seriously look after you because this is where I came unstuck with the, with the BBC. Although I was also um, um, a bit of a fool and the author of, and to an extent, the author of my own um, um, uh, misfortune, but also others screwed up too, but they were the bosses. Anyway, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't take on a terrorist organization or a nasty organized crime thing in particular if I lived in that country. Now that's a, I, I certainly wouldn't start out doing that. Now it may be that there's something that, that causes you um, great anger, but there are stories you can do which, which um, anyway, I wouldn't start out doing that. I would, I would work hard on, on other stories before I before I was doing that, and and I have to say that if I was doing something like I'm in Italy at the moment, um, my co-author on the Malta book, Carlo Benini, he chain smokes. He smokes far more than Mark, and I said to him, uh, "Smoking is bad for you, Carlo." And Carlo looked at me and he said, "I report on the Sicilian mafia because <laughs> <laughs> there are health risks, and then there are health risks." Yeah, so, it, 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 it has to be said, okay, I mean, it's true that in recent years, uh, the physical risks run by journalists have greatly risen. However, those risks have risen for everyone else in our societies as well. Okay, uh, you know, terrorist action, criminal action is taking down a lot of people who aren't journalists as well. So we have to be aware of that. Um, the other thing is, if you are working on a story that possibly involves possible stakeholders, do not rush in and start talking to people about what you're doing until you already have a clear base of information on which to figure out what is going on. Okay. And then target sources who are less dangerous. I personally had to drop an investigation early in my career that involved 22 cadavers, and I thought I might be number 23, and it was a fairly good assumption. And I didn't know what I was doing. Like uh, John said, you know, I was right at the beginning of my career and I was overreaching. I didn't know how to behave. I didn't know what precautions to take. Years later, when I worked on the extreme right in France, one of the things I did, okay, an American in France working on the French extreme right, one of the things I did was went around, go around to see my colleagues. I didn't ask them for their sources. I, I'd already read their work. And what I said to them was, what precautions do you take? And I adopted those precautions. And they were wise precautions. And when the people on the extreme right told me what they could stand and what they couldn't stand, I did not do what they could not stand. For example, there was one guy who said, you can say anything you like about me, but, but don't caricature me. And I thought, that's a pretty reasonable request. This guy is not a caricature. He's a human being and I'm gonna say what I have to say. And you know, afterwards, people that I had written about in the book came up to me, some of them hated my ass, but you know, some of them also said, well, this book was written without hatred. You said exactly what went down I don't have any problem with what you wrote and I don't have a problem with you. Okay, so you figure out who you're dealing with, where their limits are, okay, try and watch those limits. And by the way, 
Um, very often when people ask, ask this question, they haven't yet done that kind of investigation. Sankit, have you done this kind of investigation yet or is this just something you're wondering about? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll conclude there. I think gentlemen and Sangat can maybe um, get back to us on that and, and maybe we can carry that on that conversation. Yeah, the uh, thing, the that. thing is, the thing is this, you know, as John has said, you know, the areas where you're likely to get into real trouble are pretty obvious before you go in. Don't start with that. That's not what you should be thinking about. In Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism, we worked on social issues before we went into political issues and corruption, okay? Because the social issues, we knew we would get people behind us. It was a wise strategy. You might think of the same if you're thinking of going in this direction. 